first live show I ever went to was uh, Grand Funk Railroad. <laughs> I was in uh, ninth grade. I got, as a Christmas gift, a Sears Silvertone cassette deck. So my friend and I, uh, he also got that same cassette deck for Christmas. We both went to Grand Funk. We both took our cassette decks. And then about a month later, I saw the Guess Who. And then about two months after that, I saw the Who. We recorded all three of those on the Sear Silvertone cassette deck, and I still have the tapes around here somewhere. So it never occurred to us that we didn't have permission to tape. Like, why would that be an issue? It just made sense for us to go ahead and tape. I never got a sense that it was dangerous. Now. If I wanted to sell that recording, then now I'd be entering a, an illegal area, but I never felt like I was doing anything illegal in just making the recording. Those shows were pre-internet, pre-knowing about people that collected tapes. Like, we didn't know anybody else that was recording, you know? <laughs> Over the course of my life, I've seen literally thousands of shows. Some of them, like Bruce, I've probably seen a hundred times, The Who I've seen over a hundred times. Well, I graduated from the Sears Silvertone to A-Track Cartridges. I would use that for almost every show, including like Led Zeppelin, Eric Clapton, Electric Light Orchestra. That would have been around 74 to 75. For the most part, they hold up pretty good. I saw an advertisement for a Sony tape deck, a 153SD, which is sitting right here in front of me. So I ordered this Sony 153SD tape deck. It's very expensive, it was like $450 at the time, which was really expensive, but I thought, you know, I had to go for that. That seemed to have everything, VU meters, Dolby V. So in 1975, I'm lined up outside of a record store overnight in Toronto with friends of mine to buy Who tickets for the Toronto show. And uh, the guy in front of me was a guy named Mark Lukowitz and uh, I'm friends with him still to this day. And uh, he also recorded shows, which surprised me. I was like, it's the first time I met anybody else that recorded shows. And not only did he record shows, he had a list. And he was trading tapes with other people that recorded shows, which was a whole new world to me. I had no idea that that even existed. I still remember Bruce Springsteen in 1978. I remember having a few people over in my basement and I'd set up a stereo in the basement and we played back uh, Detroit or Saginaw from 1978. They were one day apart. Um, and they just sounded incredibly good on playback. And you know, they, it was it was like you were there again. You were at the show again. It was gratifying to have other people enjoy that too. The last time I used this deck was probably in 1982 on the Who tour. A friend of mine named Mark Cohen and I we're doing a Who fanzine called Who's News. The band saw to it that we had a tour pass and tickets for all the shows. We used the pass to take in equipment. The band wouldn't have been aware that we were doing that, but you know, they also probably really didn't care either. For me, um, you know, the security, having security there was always a threat but it was a threat that I'd taken every precaution to avoid. I was aware I had to make sure all the wires were covered up. If a security guard actually came down my row and passed right in front of me, I wouldn't raise any eyebrows. You know, there was nothing going on there. Um, 
It's a, a little bit of the Jedi mind trick of, uh, you know, these are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> for Springsteen in 1988, we had this new, you know, home video recorder. We had picked out seats specifically for recording. We, we knew we were going to videotape the show. We planned it all out. I'm sitting in the corner seat with the camera. Had stuff kind of covered up pretty good. Mark was sitting to my right, and he was supposed to be the guy watching for security. <laughs> and we recorded the first song, and it looks the first song looks incredibly good, even to this day. <laughs> but uh, right before the second song, I get a tap on the shoulder, and it's a security guy and another security guy. <laughs> and Mark is sitting there looking up like, like, I don't know, I don't know this guy. So we get up, and you know, we go up the aisle. We're in the corner of the Tacoma Dome, so we're close to an exit. And security guys want to like, okay, we're going to check your camera and all that stuff and take your tapes. And I see the exit door and I go, no, I'm going to take it out to my car. And I bolt for the door with Mark in tow. It's still the second song of the show. So, you know, we went around to the front of the building, bought two more tickets, went in, set up on the other side of the stage and continued filming. So we missed song number two and song number three, but we start, we pick up the show again in song number four. <laughs> and uh, carried on filming for the rest of that show. I think the general public doesn't see a distinction between tapers and bootleggers. I just wanted to tape stuff for myself. I wanted to enjoy the concert again later, you know, at home. And never occurred to me that there was anything wrong with that. And to this day, I still believe there's nothing wrong with that. I can safely say that no artist is, that I've recorded has suffered in any financial way from one of my recordings. I do consider myself an archivist. <laughs> the potential for live albums coming out of this house is, is pretty good. <laughs> There's an awfully large volume of recordings that are reasonably good quality that could be put out, but it's actually hard to quantify how many. I know for sure the DAT tapes and the cassette tapes are in the thousands only because the ones that I have numbered downstairs are already over a thousand. So, <laughs> and there's a lot we don't have numbered yet. I've seen The Who more than, probably more than 150 times. Bruce probably between 100 and 125 times, roughly. The Who I went around and actually saw several entire tours. So I saw the 79 tour in its entirety. I saw the 82 tour in its entirety. And I'd like to think that with the uh, 50th anniversary tour that I've seen the Who really for the last time. But uh, I'm keeping my fingers crossed on that. It's safe to say that in this house there are more uh, live recordings of say the Who, for example, I know for sure I've got more live recordings of The Who than The Who have. The same is possibly true for Springsteen as well. There's a good chance that there are more Springsteen shows here than they have in their archive. Financially, it's hard to estimate how much this sort of hobby has uh, cost over the years. I'd been contacted by a guy at Columbia Records. This was when uh, Pearl Jam were on Epic Records. And he didn't want to say who it was for, but I assumed it was for Eddie Vedder. He wanted me to make like 10 of my best Who tapes. So I picked a bunch of CDs out and he sent them out. And then later on the Pearl Jam tour, he let me stand on the soundboard in the soundboard area at a general admission show. And 
attach the mics to a mic stand and uh, record a show that way uh, with his permission. And that was great. That, you know, he, he referred to me as taper number one. <laughs> but uh, that was an honor. The interesting thing is when we, when we were actively trading through the mail, maybe I would trade a concert like five times. You know, that would be a lot. Now, you put it up on the internet and 500 people download it. And you're like, wow, you know, what, <laughs> what happened there? <laughs> it's just a whole different thing now. I, I may be gone before my life's body of work is appreciated <laughs> at the rate I'm going anyways. Um, uh, you know, right now, I appreciate it. Uh, people on Dime a Dozen appreciate it. It's a miracle of the modern age, really. I mean, if you could, if the... Uh, you know, the 60-year-old me could talk to the 14-year-old me. <laughs> the 14-year-old me would never believe that in a million years. <laughs>